Good morning and welcome to Park Road Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you here on this Mother's Day. Thank you for coming. We have a number of folks signing in online and we're glad to have you whether you're in the room or you're sitting at home and we're glad to see a lot of your faces here with us today. A couple of quick announcements as we begin. We have VSP meeting coming up, lunch meeting coming up on the 19th. There's sign up sheet out in one of the information counters in Health Hall. We have a fun food Friday coming up on the 27th. We always have a wonderful time eating together. We're going to the String Bean in uh, Belmont. Uh, you can sign up for that out in the uh, uh, Health Hall and a baseball game on June the 4th. We've done this the last couple years, gone to a night's ball game, and had a wonderful time sitting together as a church group. So if you'd like to go with us and watch some baseball, you can sign up for that as well. There is a QR code if you have not given us your updated information, and we're trying to get this from everyone, and as soon as everyone gives it to, it gives it to us, we'll quit bugging you about it. So if you can use your phone and go out and uh, uh, scan the QR code on the information counter, update us with all your information. There also are paper copies of that uh, somewhere around that we can get those to you and make sure that we update our database. That would be wonderful. This morning in worship, Peggy McIntyre will be leading instead of Margie Keith. Uh, uh, Margie and Peggy were fighting over who got to participate in worship this morning. And at the last moment, Peggy won, even though Margie's name was in the bulletin. So Peggy, we're glad to have you as one of our deacons leading with us this morning. Thank you for being here. Thanks to Chris White for the pre-service music. Um, and now let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds to worship as Matthew plays.
join me in reading responsively our litany of worship. Let us worship God, who is rich in mercy, who gives new life out of great love for us, who calls us to be God's partners in bringing life to those in need. that we too may be rich in mercy. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come here today to be reminded of the new life we have with you. Many times we are focused on other things, our children, our parents, our spouses, our friends, health, work, money, and the list goes on. Worries about the future or regrets about the past can be so heavy, we find it hard to breathe. We come here today to remember that you are always right here in the present moment waiting for us. Because of your great love for each of us, full of mercy and grace, you never tire of reminding us again and again of the green pastures and still waters you provide. In this time of worship, may we find the new life we seek and recognize how we can bring new life to others. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, At the Last Supper that Jesus ate with his disciples, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Keep in mind, that was right before he was betrayed, arrested, and crucified. That my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. It makes me think a bit about the difference between joy and happiness. You can find happiness in a meaningful relationship, a rewarding job, a long anticipated vacation, or even when your team wins a big game. Joy somehow runs deeper and I suspect is less dependent on outward circumstances. Jesus' words suggest that joy is connected in some way to our relationship with God. Henry Nouwen says that joy is a choice. He says we have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Where does your joy come from? And what if Nowen is right and you can choose joy every day? Let us keep silence together.
And now would you join me in our prayer of confession? Gracious and merciful God, hear our prayer for the mending of our hearts torn apart by unkindness, for the healing of our souls wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek for the sins we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the joy that your grace provides. Through Christ we pray, amen. And know that joy, the choice, choosing joy, is made easier when we remember that we are loved and we are forgiven. So be at peace. I want to invite our children to join us. I know Etta is here. She's going to come down. And when Etta is coming this morning, I want to tell you that I learned that this morning, Etta fixed breakfast for her mom. Wasn't that sweet? Would you fix breakfast for me sometime? Maybe. Okay. All right. I'll take that. Have a seat right here. I'm so glad that you are here today. You're our only uh, participant, but that's okay. Um, Amy is going to talk about helping people today and picking people up and lifting people up. And um, I wanted to remind our children that came that when we do a parent-child dedication, do you remember when we do a baby dedication and parents who have a new child, they bring that baby down front and Amy and I get to hold the baby and walk out into the congregation and introduce the baby to the congregation? We have a new baby who was born this week, beautiful little Hannah Dollywald. Her parents are Dorothy and Cam Dollywall. Amy got to see Hannah in the hospital, and she's a beautiful baby. And sometime soon, they'll be bringing Hannah, and she'll come down here, and we'll get to introduce her. And we always invite the children to come for that time, and we ask three questions. And Amy always asks the questions, and she wants to, you to give a real enthusiastic answer. You know how Amy is. She wants enthusiastic answers. And so we say, if Hannah falls down, will you help pick her up? Yes, that's pretty good. Thank you, Edda. Uh, if, w will you be a friend to Hannah? Yes. Will you play with Hannah and teach her the stories of Jesus? Yes. That's what we need to do to help one another, to pick each other up, to be a friend to one another. And that's part of what Amy is talking about today. I put together another way we can help people is to provide some food for them. Sometimes when I'm driving around and I stop at the red light, there's somebody sitting there, and they have a sign, and they say, I'm hungry. I need something to eat. And so I put together these bags, and I wanted to give you one. And in the bag, there's a little bit of water, and there's some crackers and a, a granola bar and something sweet to eat. And so I want you to take that, and the next time you and your mom are driving around and there's somebody who needs some food that's hungry, you can give them a bag, okay? And I'm going to give you, how about some fruit snacks? How about take this to your mom, too? Okay, all right, good. We're going to put the rest of these bags out front, and if anybody else would like to pick one up to have one in your car so you can help somebody when they're in need, you pick them up outside, okay? Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for making us friends to one another and giving us the opportunity to help one another. Help us to find simple ways to pick one another up, to be friends, to share with one another. We pray together in Jesus' name.
Era. And now Edda's other name gets to become Dorcas. That'll make more sense when we read the gospel. I realize uh, it might sound like an insult right now. It's not, Edda. We love you. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite metaphors for grace is here in this passage. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, no matter what might feel like it separates you from God, disease, guilt, shame, death itself, God's love can always bring the healing you need. Let's hear the words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures. God leads me beside still waters. God restores my soul. God leads me in right paths for God's name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the, of the Lord my whole life. Will Gaffney is a womanist, biblical scholar, professor, and Episcopal priest. I was reading some of her commentary this week about what I'm about to read you from the Acts of the Apostles, and she says it's a long-standing practice of the church to read through Acts during Eastertide. We are in the season of Eastertide, and it's a long-standing practice of the church to read through the Acts of the Apostles during Eastertide to followed the development of the people of the way. That's what the early Christians were called, the people of the way. And they would become what we call church. So it's a good practice in this season to read through the Acts of the Apostles. But Will Gaffney uh, notes, given that the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles are thought to have been written by the same person she finds it striking how many women and girls there are in Luke's gospel and how few there are in the Acts of the Apostles, in the story of the church. There are few women noted. But today, we get one. I'm really happy about it. So I'm going to read to you her story. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple, hang on to that word, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, who in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, he took him to the room upstairs. Sometimes those kind of rooms are called upper rooms. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing their tunics and other clothing that Dorcas, Tabitha, had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. And he turned to the body and he said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. 
and then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. You have heard the ancient story. Tabitha, I needed her this week. A woman in the Bible with a name that rarely happens that we get a name for a woman in the Bible. Oh, there are a few. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and oh, that other Mary. Elizabeth, Phoebe, Lydia. But more often, we get the woman at the well the woman with the issue of blood, some descriptor of women instead of a name. But this week, I needed a name and a story. I needed her this week. She's the only woman in the Bible given the label disciple. I needed Tabitha this week. Leading up to Mother's Day, are always days of trepidation for me in a pulpit. I had a wonderful mother, the best, and grandmothers too, and mother-in-law and grandmothers-in-law. And I've loved being a mother perhaps more than anything else about my life. 
I have only known bliss around all things motherhood. And perhaps it's my bliss that has made me so aware of so much pain around this word mother. For the people for whom mother is a word of pain and grief and regret and sadness and incompetence and fear and isolation, may you know a measure of God's love that will somehow be a balm for your weary and hurting soul. For those who have known strife with your mother, for those who want to be a mother and keep experiencing loss, for those whose mothers have died, for those whose child has died, for those whose children have gone astray, and for those who are estranged from their mothers and or their children, for those who have faced the pain of choices around mothering that have left you feeling, in addition to the sadness and maybe fear that you were already feeling, now you're feeling guilt and shame added to the already difficult reality of your situation in the face of your choices. And that guilt and shame has often come hurling at you from people of faith, showering you with guilt and shame and degradation. For all of you, I'm sorry. I am so aware that you are within earshot of any words that I offer today. So many people can't drag themselves to church of all places on days like today. I know that a lot of people are visiting their mothers somewhere else. A lot of people have taken children to see grandparents. And some folks just aren't here because it's too hard of a day to be here. Fearing that something will be said in worship that will trigger the pain, the tears, the shame. That we will be tone deaf and just walk around saying, Happy Mother's Day, as if it's happy for all. I understand that. I understand not being here. Though let me say clearly that there's no better place to cry your tears than here. But it's difficult, and I get that. And as if Mother's Day, which began as a peace movement and not a sentimentalized Hallmark, Hallmark initiative, as if Mother's Day wasn't hard enough, this week in our country's headlines, we've read an awful lot about women and women's reproductive rights and health. This is treacherous territory, and I know that. But I cannot shy away from the angst and turmoil that I have felt all week. There are so many very strong feelings and emotions and so many passionate words being thrown about all around us. To not acknowledge this on this morning would mean that we are tone deaf. And that's about the last thing the church needs to be. It's been said that one should enter the pulpit with a Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other asking, what does the Bible have to say about those headlines? And how can those headlines better inform our faith story? So with the headlines naming names like Roe and Wade, I opened the Bible this week to today's lectionary text, which was chosen years and years and years ago for this Sunday. And I read the name Tabitha. Oh, Tabitha, I needed you this week. A woman in the Bible with a name and a story. I needed her this week. She's the only woman in the Bible called a disciple. I needed Tabitha this week because all I could think about this week were all the people, yes, especially the women, but all the people who are dying who need for us to tell them, get up. Did you catch the beauty of this short story? 
Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. But Tabitha was a do-gooder of the highest order. And when she became ill and died, it was the women that surrounded her, mostly the women for whom she had done all the good. It sounds like it was mostly the widows, which would just be another way of talking about the poor, because without a man, any woman was poverty-stricken and down and out and last and least and lost and forgotten and forsaken, except by Tabitha, who had been Jesus to them. This Jesus, she made them clothes. This Jesus, she fed them. This Jesus, she lifted them up when they were dying. It was this Jesus that they prepared her body and placed her in an upper room, not so different from the upper room story of that other Jesus. It even makes you wonder, could Tabitha have been in that other upper room story herself as a true and named disciple of Jesus? But this Jesus, she was the one who had brought life. And anyone that brings life, the kind of life that Jesus brought and brings, is a disciple whether they are named so or not. But Tabitha was named so. Tabitha was apparently a woman of means and status, and she understood that the flip side of privilege is responsibility. Unfortunately, it is true that there are few people, few disciples of any gender, who would risk their entire economic status in order to provide for the less privileged. Mitzi Smith wrote in her commentary about this that by taking such a risk, our good works and just acts challenge and transcend unjust systems. Many of us, of us she says, consider, first consider how our giving will and will not diminish or increase our own living. We are willing to talk about, she says, dying for Christ but not risking our living for others. The world, she says, would be a better place. The world will never be a better place as long as Tabithas are few. And even if their bodies experience a resurrection in this life like Tabithas, even that resurrected body was a mortal one. So it is the spirit of Tabitha. The spirit in her that we hope will take on an immortality among the living. Tabitha used her privilege, her wealth, just acts and gifts and prophetic speech for the benefit of the less privileged, the widows, the indigent, the hungry, the depressed, the oppressed, the marginalized, the penalized. I needed Tabitha this week to remind me that in the spirit of Jesus and in that same spirit, the spirit of Tabitha, I too am an Easter person. Now please, I beg of you, don't get lost in the sensational of the story or you will surely miss the point. It is awesome to be dead and brought back to life. Who doesn't love that? But that is not what the story is about. The point is when Tabitha, who was alive and well and working among all the people who were in most need, when she was at her lowest, Peter told her to get up. It was that man named Simon that Jesus renamed Peter, rock, strong, steady, faithful. And Jesus told him, on this rock, Peter, I will build my church, and even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So if you will allow me to take just a few leaps and jump through a few hoops and continue to hold the Bible in one hand and the headlines in the other, then what we have here today is the church telling the broken, the hurting, the grieving, the despairing to come on, get up. We've got you. But I'm sorry to report that the headlines 
that talk about how often the faith community speaks to those who are dying. I've got dying in quotes because this is about much more than any literal death. This is about all the ways that people are hurting to their core and the headlines about people of faith or people that claim faith, those headlines aren't reading, get up. Those headlines are calling people horrible names. Those headlines of people of faith are condemning people who are in terrible situations and facing horrific choices. From the mouths of people of faith, we often hear the most heinous venom. And all the church is called to say is get up. Get up. There's life and hope. There can be joy and recovery. There is mercy and grace, amazing grace. There's second chances and third and fourth too. There's forgiveness. There's compassion. There's care. There's good news even in the face of what seems like untenable circumstances. There's welcome. There's a fullness to life, abundance even. There is still resurrection. Beloved, we are Easter people. Don't forget that. But you have to get up. And she did. Tabitha opened her eyes, the text says. What has been your best eye-opening experience? The text says she sat up. When have you found yourself easing back into the land of the living after you've been down and out? Then the text says, Peter, Peter gave her his hand and he helped her up. After he told her to get up, he helped her up. He really did, with no judgment, no condemnation, with no questions or need for her to explain herself. He didn't wait for her to pull herself up by her own bootstraps that she had. She had bootstraps. Most of the women didn't. But he didn't even ask her to pull herself up by her own bootstraps. He helped her up and then he called all of those who had been weeping and mourning, all of those who had gathered in that upper room, all of those who had been showing off all the things that Tabitha had made for them like a fashion show. And they were telling the stories of all she had done for them and given to them. And he showed her to be alive. And that's what made the headline news in Joppa that day. It was the talk of the town when a woman was brought back to life by an encouraging word and a helpful hand. If you are within earshot of me right now, you either are someone or you know someone that needs an encouraging word and a helpful hand. No matter where you stand on any issue, the church was founded on the bedrock principle of the encouraging word and the helpful hand. We would do well to remember that in every word that we speak, in every post that we submit, and in every action we take. Helpful word, encouraging word, helpful hand. I'm indebted again to womanist biblical scholar Will Gaffney. In her blog post from 2014, it was entitled, When Mother is the Hardest Word. And in that piece, she writes, On this Mother's Day, I am reminded of the risk inherent in being a girl or woman on display in particular ways. For all those women who have chosen motherhood and mothered the children of their hearts 
and wombs and streets and those they have embraced from near and far with or without papers, I give thanks. For all the men who have loved and nurtured with exquisite tenderness in the absence of any other mothering, I give thanks. With all the motherless children and for those for whom it would have been better to be motherless, I weep. And for the daughters of all trafficked girls and the mothers who are fighting for their return, I pray and I work. The American Mother's Day industry seems willfully and uncaringly blind to the lives, struggles, and deaths of most of the world's mothers and their children. And in borrowing Kate Bowler's words, may we be people marked by a bright hope in the midst of the darkest hours. May we be Easter people. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray together. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Release to the captives. God Anoint us on this day to proclaim release to those who are captive. And in our day, no less than Jesus' own day, people become captive to so much. In this country, this day, 1% of our neighbors, more than 1% of our neighbors are literally captive in prisons of our own making. Systems more interested in punishment than rehabilitation. Let us proclaim release to the captives. Some of our neighbors are captive to subsistence living, to making just enough to get through each day, just barely feeding their kids and staying off the street. And some are captive to the market, an economy where enough is never enough, a world where keeping up with the Joneses and obsession with a portfolio of too much just becomes a way of life. Some are captive to their own bodies, broken by disease and mental illness. Some are captive to fear. Russian bombs, extremist terrorism, gang warfare, inner city violence. Some are captive to hatred, to the other in our midst, those who come from different places, who see the world with a different orientation altogether, those who vote different convictions, who speak different truths. In this angry age, the whole world seems to be captive to an uncivil, civil anger in the air, to anger against a system that doesn't do enough, government that's too small, or a system that's too big, denying as many rights as it secures through intrusion into the most private aspects of our lives. And we're all captive to the talking heads, the arrogant pundits, the fear-evoking media moguls, the incessant noise on social media. Anoint us this day, God of the only true peace. Anoint us to proclaim release to the captives. Give us a new sensitivity eyes that see the depth and the breadth of problems, and in the place of our hearts of stone, give us the heart of Christ, a heart of compassion for all who are bent by the world and need us to lift them up. Free us from all that captivates us today, and then bind us to a divine love that will make us slaves to the greater good and to the least of these among us. Jesus came to proclaim release to the captives. In us, may it be so. Amen. As Glenn Smith comes, let me remind you that about 10 years ago, we adopted a new practice in worship. 
uh, for our offering, we would adopt a monthly mission. This was a way for us to extend our mission hand. Um, any cash in the offering plate every Sunday goes to an additional mission that we choose. Um, you can designate to that mission, but any cash for that month goes to that mission offering. Over the last 10 years, we've given thousands of dollars, extended our mission efforts by by thousands and thousands of dollars uh, to, to uh, worthy agencies in our community. Today, Glenn Smith comes to teach us, to talk to us for just a couple of moments about life connections, an appropriate uh, agency in our community. Glenn, we're glad to have you. Come speak to us. What an honor to be here today on Mother's Day, a day that means so much to all of us in so many different ways. Um, I've already, my heart has been touched just by listening to the messages today. I've already picked out a couple of things. Uh, um, the idea of joy being internal and understanding that happiness is external. We'll have happy days, but joy is something here if you can create it within yourself, it's here to stay. And the message by Pastor Dean on um, the responsibility of privilege. Um, that's something that I wake up every day and think about every day. Um, my name is Glenn Smith, I'm the founder and executive director of the agency I founded. Um, some well, 1998, I, I, I don't know how, exactly how many years that is ago, about 24, I guess. Actually, um, it's appropriate I'm speaking here on, uh, on Park Road. I, um, in, in 1987, I had a private practice out on Park Road, on the corner of Park Road and uh, Ideal Way, called the Family Connection, and uh, was there for 10 years. and. Although I enjoyed the work, I felt I was missing something and got the opportunity uh, in 1998, about 10 years later, to start teaching in the Mecklenburg County Jail. Um, was teaching a life skills class to men that were reentering our community. And it's kind of funny to say that that when I, I, when I began that, I, it just kind of feels weird to say that I've, I felt at home in jail. It, and next week I'll uh, teach another class there. I've been doing that for about 24 years. But something came out of that experience that built what I know as of life connections of the Carolinas today. I was teaching, it was in, um, 2004, it was right about this time of year, and a gentleman in orange came up to me after class and he said, Mr. Smith, um, I wish I had met you and people that you have coming into, our, into the jail before now. I wish I had heard some of the things that you're talking about. I've been incarcerated on and off. I'm 30 years old now, I've been in jail on and off since I was 15 years old. And I know if I had had a mentor or someone like the people you bring here, I wouldn't be here today. That stuck with me. And it was just a couple months later, I approached an organiz uh, a committee here in town that's uh, still prevalent today called the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. And was rewarded a $35,000 uh, grant to start what they would term a court diversion program. And that program was designed to keep kids out of jail, to be a prevention so men like Mr. Jamison would not have to be in my class a lot later, a, a lot later on in their life. Well, two weeks ago, that particular program just got funded for its 19th year. A little bit more we're getting now, and we're serving several more kids. Uh, and since that time, we have started 19 different programs 
in 13 counties, um, the different counties. Some of those programs are family skill building programs. Some of those programs are mentoring programs. We have a vocational program here in Charlotte, North Carolina, along with um, a restorative justice program out in Anson County. Uh, we just started last year a mental health practice, which takes me back to my roots. I'm not practicing, but I have clinicians practicing in Union County, only kids that are coming out of the court system. That's who we serve, kids directly coming out of the court system, still diverting them from the juvenile justice system. Over those past years, I guess since 2004, that's about 18 years, we've served over 5,000 families. Um, many of them in uh, Hispanic, Spanish-speaking uh, parents that have settled in this area. But we still remain one of the best kept secrets of a nonprofit in the Charlotte area. And I know, as I'm getting eh, a little older, that I don't want it to end that way. So we have started on a campaign to get our message out there, let people know what we're doing in the community. Um, and our, our dreams are, are great. One is, Someday, uh, we are now housed over at uh, Mission Gathering Church out there uh, off, of, uh, off of Caldwell and North Davidson and that area. We're on 15th Street. They have been wonderful, allowing us to use their facility now for about five or six years. But we really want our own place. We want a place that we can call our own, where kids can come, that there's recreational areas, there's a cafeteria, that there's uh, rooms, room enough for our staff, which I hope would be a growing staff, and that um, we could e uh, even maybe pro uh, provide shelter if needed for certain individuals. The other thing that touch, uh, I think about daily is we turn away as many families as we serve. And I want to be able to take every family that is wanting help uh, that they can come to us and we can provide that service. And I guess my biggest dream would be that when I come back, I'm not ready to retire yet, but when I come back in another 15 years maybe, that Life Connections would be flourishing. It would be moving and serving and providing that responsibility of privilege to those people who need a helping hand. Another thing I heard from Pastor Dean. And I, my dream is when I go in there, they won't know who I am. This started with me, but I do not want it to end with me. And I would just invite you to um, go to our website. It's keepkidsoutofjail.org. That's pretty easy to remember. The mission being keeping kids out of jail and keeping families together, keepkidsoutofjail.org. I'd like you to pick up a bracelet in the lobby. It says, I am creating the best me I can be. Inside's all of our information. We also have brochures out there, and um, if you want to pick up one of my cards, that would be good too. But the bracelet is what I'd really like you to take, and if you don't wear them, please give it to someone. But I thank you for this opportunity. I would, I'm going to stay. I, I, I was thinking about leaving after this, but like I said, I've been picking up so much for the service, I'm going to stick around. And uh, I hope to meet some of you afterwards. And uh, Again, it's been a pleasure to take some time with you all. Thank you so much.
If you would join with us in our work in this place of lifting people up, we would be glad to have you. Amy and I will be standing at the front, but we're only going to sing one verse. As a commitment as we move forward, the third verse of We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky, come join us. Please be seated. You know, we live a lot of our life trying to decide whether to keep silent or to speak. And no matter how you choose your words and no matter how compassionate you try to be, your words are triggers. Your words are triggers. I just hope we will remember that. I really wrestled this week with whether to go there or not. I don't really regret my decision. But it's just a reminder that everybody in earshot of you also is carrying something heavy and hard. And if they aren't carrying it themselves, they know someone who is. So just be tender and gentle with your words. The final word is not ours, but the Lord. So hear this good word of benediction as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May God give you grace this day to love with all your heart. That you might do justice. To love with all your soul. That you might show mercy. To love with all your mind. That you might walk humbly with your God. As you go into the world this day, dear friends, love the Lord your God with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.